I'm Susan Hubbard. Welcome to my office. This is the Gallery of Questionable Taste. It comprises items that have been donated to me over the years by students, family members. Sometimes I've even found my own. That's the tube of glue. This, for instance, came from New Zealand. I spent a week there as a consultant to Massey University in Palmerston North. I spent so many hours in meetings that I had very little chance to see New Zealand while I was there. But across from my hotel, there was a supermarket, and I decided I would use it to try to track down some New Zealand artifacts. As you can see, this is a can of Big Eat. All day breakfast with beans, sausages, potatoes, and bacon. I was mesmerized by it. What did it tell me about New Zealand culture? Well, it told me that they had a sense of humor and that they were pretty down to earth, and in fact, the Kiwis are that way. I took this with me to the master class in fiction I was teaching the next day and asked students to use this can in a short story. Much to my surprise, they treated it as if it were incidental, as if it were like a bottle of ketchup in our culture. But I brought it home with me and did the same exercise with UCF students. They made this a very big deal. To them, the can of Big Eat symbolized a kind of breakthrough, a kind of cultural moment in which all good things came in one small package. My research is qualitative, not quantitative. I don't deal with numbers very much. I deal with questions that perplex me. I deal with anomalies such as those in my gallery here. And I'm always looking for things that don't quite make sense because when you find two things that don't go together, when you find a, a person whose facade doesn't match what's inside, that's where you have dramatic conflict, and that's where good fiction always begins for me. Recently, I put together an essay for a book called The Handbook of Creative Writing, published by University Press of Edinburgh, Scotland. I had already written some comic novels. This is one of them. And I'd never really thought about what makes a book funny until I was asked to write the essay. So I did what most people do when they're at the beginning of research. I tried to frame some questions that were not so specific as to ward off possible conclusions, but were specific enough so that I wasn't trying to uncover a, a universe instead of a smaller scope. I began my research by going to library databases. And there were some excellent ones available online. The one that I used most was called LitFinder, and there's a component of LitFinder called Essay Finder. I also did a general catalog search looking for books on humor, nonfiction books. At that point, I was lucky enough to get a graduate student assistant, and she helped me track down more titles. She would actually bring the books from the library to me, and we'd decide which ones were worth summarizing which ones were worth reading in detail and which ones were useless. And by doing that together, we managed to get through an enormous amount of literature in a relatively short time. When the essay was finished, I had discovered some interesting things. One, humor is a lot like the art of surrealism in that it depends on incongruities. A dog walks into a bar, say, there's a joke. A dog walks into a bar and orders a drink. There is displacement. The dog can't do that in real life. I used interlibrary loan to find books that weren't in the UCF catalog. And by the time we'd sorted through the available literature on the topic, we had more questions than we'd started with. And that's the way research goes. Sometimes you begin thinking you know the probable solution to your problem. And by the time you've finished researching, you've got a whole new set of questions and even new problems. I decided when I'd finished this essay and sent it off, to consider its implications for teaching. That is, what if I took the same principles that apply to surrealistic art and to writing humor and used them in the classroom? And from that area of study, I came up with an essay, The Fish Lectures on Swimming, Surrealism and the Art of Teaching. The essay was published in a newsletter and was also the basis for a presentation I made at a professional conference later on. So you see, when you begin with one question, it leads to all manner of other ones and sometimes takes you to places you never expected to go. When I first moved to Florida, I was trying to figure out the culture of the state, and my husband and I did what most people do when they move to a new place. We read as much as we could get our hands on. Uh, we were trying to figure out why so many writers chose Florida as a setting for their fiction. I happened to meet the director of the University Press of Florida soon after we moved, and I suggested to her that it might be fun to put together an anthology of contemporary Florida fiction. And she agreed, and this is the book that resulted from that idea. 
We began with questions. Why would anyone want to write about Florida in particular? Why are so many writers drawn here? And then we established some parameters. We decided to try to find stories that were set in Florida, not necessarily written by people who lived there, and that had been published since 1985. We had to draw that line because otherwise we would have been reading everything. As it was, we ended up reading more than 600 short stories. We solicited some fiction by placing ads in Poets and Writers, which is a journal that most writers read. And we also used, again, LitFinder has a story finder function where you put in your keywords and out come a whole list of stories. As I said, we read more than 600 and we ended up choosing 21 to appear in the book. What did they have in common? I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction. The theme of many of Florida's story is nostalgia, longing for a past that never was, regret for what might have been, discovery, not of the fountain of youth, but of a paradise lost. Unlike the New England story, haunted by rich colonial history and bound by tradition in its land use, architecture, and customs, and not like the classic Southern story, whose roots lie in a miasma of past glory and whose present celebrates eccentricity. The Florida story tends to be more brash and yet more uncertain. Retirees, snowbirds, natives, all are at odds with the alligators in the heat. Strip malls, post offices, not post offices, libraries or courthouses as they are in New England. Strip malls are the landmarks of our communities. Fast food outlets, trailer parks and pawn shops reinforce the sense of transience. Contemporary Florida is a place where nature and society conspire to make the everyday world surreal. That word again. When I finished this collection, it was sent off to the press and it was sent out for peer review. And that's another important part of the research process. When you've written an essay or a chapter in a book, it goes to others in the field who are going to give you professional feedback. And oftentimes that leads to revisions and making the piece stronger. So that's my scholarly kind of research. Now I want to talk a little about my creative research because I've written and published six books. When I wrote The Society of S, which came out last year, and The Year of Disappearances, which is coming out tomorrow, I asked certain colleagues if they would read the manuscript for me and gave, give me their opinions. I wanted that kind of peer feedback, and it was extremely useful for me. But where does fiction come from? It comes from the same kind of anomaly, often. How could someone do that? What would happen if X met Y? I was compelled by the idea of a teenage girl who was homeschooled, who didn't have friends, who didn't watch television, and suddenly was thrust into the world. How would she survive? I decided to depart from realism for these books and use elements of the supernatural. And more and more, I think, literary writers are turning to what we're calling speculative fiction because it's fun to invent your own laws of physics. It's fun to make characters do things that we can't do but wish we could. In order to do some of the research for this new book, I went to the Okefenokee Swamp. Why? I can't give you a logical explanation. I'd had a dream set in the swamp, and I decided it was a really good idea to spend part of spring break, this would be last year, in the swamp, and I dragged my husband along, who's not an enthusiast of swamps. We went out on a boat, and it was a tour that was supposed to last about an hour and a half, but our guide was new on the job, and he got lost. And as a result, we spent four hours and came back when it was so dark that all we could see when we flashed our flashlights on the shore, we did that to keep from going aground because the boat had no running lights. What would come back at us were little red alligator eyes. It was creepy. And the creepiness convinced me to use the swamp in not just one scene in the book, but in several. I'm going to read a, a description of it. The waterway we rode was called a canal. At first it was the color of slate, gray with indigo veins and variations, and the canoes rode it calmly, our oars making barely a splash. There was no wind, and the only sound was the low groaning of frogs. Along the banks, alligators lay, singly or in couples, some watching us, some ignoring us. Mating season was two months away, and they weren't yet inclined to be territorial. For several minutes, none of us talked. The air smelled fresh and aromatic, reminding me a little of the smell of witch hazel. My mother kept a bottle of it in the bathroom at home. After we rounded the canal's last bend, we entered a prairie, a wide expanse of flowering swamp. Here the water became deep brown, the color of steeped tea. A breeze began, 
and conical yellow flowers bobbed close to the canoe. As we went further, those flowers seemed to multiply, emerging from fleshy green foliage strewn across the prairie as far as we could see. Professor Riley said the flowers were called Golden Club. Their other name was never wet because their succulent-like leaves repel moisture. They resist the elements that do not favor them, he said. They are likely to endure. With me on my research trip to the swamp and elsewhere, I always take a camera as well as a notebook. And I recommend that students do this as well when they do their writing. Uh, one assignment I've used in the classroom is, is having students each buy a disposable camera and walk around Orlando and look for things that just don't make sense. Look for things, objects, people, situations that seem to embody and inherit dramatic conflict because that's where a story starts, when the things don't go together. Right now I'm getting ready to leave on a book tour for my new book and next fall I'm going to go to England. I'm on sabbatical then and I'm going to be speaking at three British universities about creative writing and how it's different there from the way it is here. Also, I'll be taking my camera and my notebook and looking for things that don't make sense and some of them will find their way back here. Once again, I'm Susan Hubbard. Thanks for stopping by today. If you want to visit me in the future, you can find me at www.susanhubbard.com. I am Susan Hubbard and this is my office. <laughs>